In Hebrews 11, we find the roll call of faith. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Moses. And we learned that what all those heroes of faith have in common is that they were justified by their faith. Every one of them, justified. And what is justification? Justification is a positional relational transaction in which one is counted righteous. That is, when we're justified, it is just as if we had never sinned. And it is just as if we were no longer sinners. But just as if is not the same thing as accomplished fact. Abraham was justified by his faith, but he was not a good person. Good men don't offer their wives to another man for his harem, for personal or political expediency. Lot was justified by faith and counted righteous. But he was not a good person. Good people don't subject their daughters to mob rape to save themselves. Good people don't get drunk and sleep with their daughters and have children by them. Samson was justified by faith. But he was not a good person. Good people don't tie live animals together and set them on fire. No, justification does not produce righteous people. It produces people who are counted as righteous. That's why the faithful of the Old Covenant are still in the grave, awaiting the resurrection prior to facing the judgment. Because if they had been judged immediately after death, they would not have withstood God's scrutiny. No, according to Hebrews 11.40, they will not be judged until after they have been perfected, which is to say, until after they have been made actually righteous, actually sinless. And what is it that will accomplish this feat in them? What is it that will actually transform them from being sinful by nature to being sinless by nature? The promise. That, according to Hebrews 11, 39 through 40, is what makes the difference between the faithful of your and the faithful of four, the promise. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And what is the promise? Grace. Luke 24, 49, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now most people read that and they think that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, but that can't possibly be right because the Spirit isn't power from on high. The Spirit isn't something the Holy Spirit is someone. He is the third person of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is powerful, but the Spirit himself is not power. Not only that, but the apostles already had the Holy Spirit in some measure prior to the day of Pentecost. According to John 14, 17, the apostles had the Holy Spirit in some measure prior to the crucifixion. Uh, Jesus said, The Helper is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees nor knows him. But you know him, because he dwells within you and will remain in you. And then, according to John 20, 21-23, after the resurrection and before the ascension, the apostles received the Spirit in greater measure. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, 
they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And many see what is recorded in Luke 24, 45 as yet another reception of the Spirit. Then, he op then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit is not the promise. The power from on high is the promise. This is clear from Acts 1, 8, where Jesus tells the apostles, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit is not the promise, but it is the Holy Spirit who delivers the promise, which is why Paul refers to him in Ephesians 1, 13 as the Holy Spirit of the promise. Which promise is grace, the power from on high, which is exactly what's in view in Acts 2, 38-39. And Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And just to be clear here, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not the gift which is the Holy Spirit, but the gift which is born by the Holy Spirit, the gift which is delivered by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1-4, Luke tells us, And being assembled together with them, Jesus uh, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. And reading that, no one imagines that the promise in view is the Father himself. No, the promise is the promise given by the Father. And in the same way, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not the Spirit himself, but the promise given by the Spirit. Which delivery requires reception of the Spirit? The two come together. We receive the Spirit before we receive grace. One brings the other, but they're not the same thing. Now, when we come to Acts 2.38, what we find is that the gathered crowd listening to Peter preach has already heard and believed. So they have already been justified. Now, there are those who, were say that, who would say that having been justified, they were at that point already saved. Full stop. And accordingly, when in Acts 2.37, we find that when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter could very well have said, Nothing. Church dismissed. You've been justified by your faith. Justification is all you need. But he didn't say that. Instead, he answered them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Peter knew they believed. He knew they had faith, and he surely knew that by their faith they were justified. So why didn't he just stop and leave well enough alone? Well, I presume it's because he knew that pardon isn't sufficient. He knew that amnesty is no more than Abraham had received. Abraham was justified by his faith, but he did not receive the promise. And Peter's mission in the name of Jesus Christ was to deliver the promise. And the promise isn't mere justification. The promise is also sanctification. And that's why he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Not so that they could have the Holy Spirit, but so they could have the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. Which gift is grace? The power from on high. Because that is what would make them actually holy. That is what would make them actually sinless. That is what would make them actually guiltless. Now, as soon as I say that, as I said last week, very much the same thing, I begin to get emails. And that's what happened to me this week. I got emails from hither, thither, and yon, saying, but what about? What about the believer who has not been taught about baptism? What about the believer who has no access to baptism? What about my aunt, Gertrude, who was faithful all her life and who not only believed ardently, but who lived the life of Christ, feeding the poor, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and imprisoned? What about the person who confesses his or her faith and then is killed in a car wreck on the way to the church to be baptized? Surely God wouldn't send such a person to hell for lack of baptism. Surely such a person would go to heaven. Well, I don't want to treat that lightly. Let's reason this through. You see, one of the people who wrote me this week to object thusly is someone who's particularly close to me. She's a relative whom I've known all of my life. And I love her very much. And this isn't just a hypothetical question. Her question involves real people that she knows and loves. And the answers to these questions really matter. And not just to her, they matter in an absolute sense. And after she wrote me this week, I invited her to keep listening. Because I was going to demonstrate to her this week that we don't differ on this matter as much as it may seem that we do. Well, that's what I want to do now, is explain that. I want to begin by stipulating some things that I know we both agree on. Let's agree that God is competent. That he knows what he's doing. Let's agree that he knew what he was doing when he chose the person in question as one of his elect. Let's agree that he knew what he was doing when he called that person. Let's agree that he knew what he was doing when he granted that person ears to hear. Let's agree that he knew what he was doing when he gave that person the measure of faith required for him or her to confess faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and to embrace him as their Lord and Savior. And Let's agree that God knew what he was doing when he granted that any such person would be justified by their faith. So far, so good. But let's go a couple steps further. Let's agree that not so much as a sparrow falls to the ground without God knowing it, and that he knows what he's doing when he lets one fall. And let's agree that should one who has been justified by faith fall to the ground before having received baptism, that God, who allows such things to happen, knows what he's doing. And he knows how to sort out the salvific status of such a person. And let's agree that I don't know how to sort out the salvific status of such a person, and neither do you, because the Bible doesn't spell it out. But God knows, and his justice is perfect. And when on the last day we learn what he has determined, there will be nothing for either of us to do but to rejoice in his perfect justice. Now, that may sound to some of you like a cop-out, but I assure, you, I assure you that it is not, because I'm going to ask you to stipulate one last thing. We agree that God is competent. We agree that he knows what he's doing. And I would hope that we agree that God knew what he was doing when he commended baptism to us. 
I would hope that we agree that God knew what he was doing when through his servant Peter, he told the faithful who had been justified that they also needed to be sanctified. That he knew what he was doing when by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he enabled Peter to say, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Beloved, this is why I spend so much time teaching about our reason for being as Christians. Because anyone who thinks that the Christian's reason for being is to make it to heaven has a severely impoverished understanding of Christianity. Heaven is not our goal. Heaven is our destination. Which destination is secure so long as we continue in our faith? Abraham's destination is secure. It was secured by his faith. And according to Hebrews 11, that isn't nothing. But it is next to nothing when compared to the promise. Heaven isn't the promise. Getting there alive is the promise. As it says in 1 John 2.25, And this is the promise that he made to us, everlasting life. Abraham is dead. Truly dead. He isn't in heaven right now. In his spirit, he's in paradise and in his body he is in Sheol, in the grave. And on the last day he will rise, as all human beings will rise. But according to Hebrews 11, because of his solidarity with us, Abraham will rise glorified, even though he has not yet received the promise. Because we are recipients of the promise, and the promise is grace the power from on high which gives us everlasting life. And because of Abraham's solidarity with us, he will be glorified as well. That, according to Hebrews 11, is guaranteed to all the faithful of the Old Covenant. Even though they died not having received the promise, the promise will be retroactively bestowed upon them because of their faith. So, in a sense, by our baptisms, Abraham is saved. And this begs the question, if the fathers of the Old Covenant are saved without baptism, can the fathers of the New Covenant be saved without baptism? My answer to that question is, I wouldn't bet my life on it. Now, you're free to bet your life on it if you want to. Well, don't you believe that I'm saved? What I believe doesn't matter. It's what the Lord believes that matters. Well, why should I be baptized if I'm already justified by my faith? I don't know. Maybe because it is commended to us 112 times in 81 verses in the New Testament. But baptism is a work. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. Well, faith without works is dead, and grace is the promise. Grace is not God being nice. Mercy is God being nice. Justification is God being nice. This is why understanding grace matters. Because if grace is God being nice, if grace is unmerited favor, then the promise is both redundant and contradictory. If grace is God being nice, then the message of Hebrews 11 is the faithful of the Old Covenant were saved by God being nice, but they did not receive the promise, which is God being nice. But grace isn't God being nice. Grace is the life substance of the incarnate Christ implanted into us, into our beings, body and spirit, where it takes up residence. And as we grow in grace, grace grows in us. 
and slowly displaces the life substance of Adam in us until finally on the last day we rise fully perfected. And in the meantime, for all the days of our lives from our baptisms onward, we are possessed of the raw material of which glory is made. And with the primary tool, we need to transform grace into glory, which is faith. But if you are not possessed of grace, your faith will produce nothing for God. Now, it'll produce something for you, but certainly nothing more than it produced for all the people listed in Hebrews 11. You may get into heaven, though, as I said, I wouldn't bet my life on it. But when you get there, you'll be scrubbing toilets. But the servant who possesses grace is a profitable servant. Surely you don't want to end up like the one talent servant who was offered something of great value by his master and was expected to increase its value, but instead said, I'm satisfied with what I've got and you should be satisfied with what you've got too because what you've got is me. But I've got news for you. When Christ returns, his mission will be to harvest all of the glory that we have generated for God the Father through our faithing. You aren't the prize. Glory is the prize. The reason why we get swept up in the harvest is because his glory is in us. Now he does love us. And he will reward us according to the profit we have made for him while on earth. Those are our treasures in heaven. But if you are an empty vessel, I wouldn't count on being caught up in the harvest. On the first day of church, ever, Peter was presented with a large congregation of people who had heard and believed. A large, a large congregation of people who had already been justified by their faith. And they asked him, what should we do next? And Peter answered, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone the Lord our God calls to himself. And from that I have concluded that what Christ intends for us in the way of salvation is that at the end of the day we should find ourselves in better condition than the faithful of the old covenant. That he doesn't want us merely to be justified. He wants us to be sanctified as well. Now, there are those of you who will say, well, I believe justification is the same as salvation. Just to prove it to you, I'm going to forgo baptism. Because all they know about baptism, or all they think they know about it, because this is what they've been told by their pastors, is that it is not necessary for salvation. Well, suit yourself. If you don't want the promise, don't take it. If you don't want grace, don't take it. If you don't want the life substance of the incarnate Christ, don't take it. If you don't want treasures in heaven, forgo them. If you want to be like the, uh, excuse me, if you don't want to be like the ten talent servant, don't be. If you want to be like the one talent servant, go right ahead. It's your salvation. You work it out. As Paul tells us in Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, I don't believe it. I don't believe baptism is a means of grace. I believe grace comes to all who believe. I don't believe baptism actually accomplishes anything. It's nothing but an outward sign of an inward faith. Well, I understand that. I don't appreciate it, but I comprehend it. But beloved, as I said earlier, God commands baptism to us 
112 times in 81 verses in the New Testament. Clearly, he thinks it's worth doing. And in my study of the Word, I have come to the conclusion that it is an instrumental means of salvation, without which one cannot receive the promise. But it doesn't matter what I believe about baptism any more than it matters what you believe about it. God commands us to do it. And it clearly means something to him. About this, there can be no argument. Anyone who tries to tell you that baptism is meaningless is a fool. And anyone who tries to tell you that baptism is merely symbolic doesn't understand the ways of God very well, because as far as I can tell, God never commands us to do anything that is merely symbolic. The number of commands that God gives us that have no actual substance is zero. And I guarantee you that baptism is not an empty act of symbolism. It accomplishes something. Now, I believe it accomplishes a great deal. You may believe that it accomplishes very little. But if I'm wrong, my belief will not increase the stakes of baptism and if you are wrong, your belief will not decrease the stakes of baptism. Rather, baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit will accomplish whatsoever the Godhead has ordained that it should accomplish, without regard to what you or I or anyone else apart from the Lord think that it ought to accomplish. And the baptizee's failure to understand baptism properly does not mitigate its efficacy in any way. As we're told in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways defer to Him, and He will make straight your paths. And as we read in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the, to the consumer, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Now, that is not to say that it isn't important to understand what baptism accomplishes. But what it does mean is that it's important to put that knowledge into perspective. You know, the most important thing for us to know about baptism is that it should be done. Because anyone who fails to do it has no claim on the promise. And that makes its accomplishments, whatever they may be, irrelevant. But everyone who, who receives the baptism ordained by the Lord will receive the, all the blessings of the Lord's baptism without regard to what they know about those blessings. And with that in view, I don't know how anyone of good conscience could ever tell a fellow believer that baptism is not necessary. Whether you believe it's necessary for salvation or not, you can't possibly believe that it's not necessary for all believers. All the commands of God are necessary. Deuteronomy 8.3, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth a man live. Proverbs 35, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Luke 4, 4, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word 
of God. Beloved, I find it very difficult to appreciate those who do everything that they can do to diminish the importance of baptism as though faith is nullified if one has to be obedient to be saved. Do you want the promise or not? If so, why do you kick against the goads? Salvation is conditional. Justification is conditional. You can't get it without faith. And sanctification is conditional. You can't get it without the promise, which is grace. And according to Peter in Acts 2, the normative means of securing the promise is by baptism. Stop kicking against the goads. If you have not been baptized, do so. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And that, beloved, is my lesson for today.